started. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm Leslie. Uh, Nate is sitting in the back there. And Teresa is sitting back behind him. You guys, can, you guys can show yourselves. Nate and Teresa, we are the, the, the people who are writing books. Um, we have a mailing list. If for anyone who's not on it, I'm just going to pass it around. It's like a once a week newsletter that lets you know about events like this and new books and stuff that we get in here. Um, we basically just <coughs> do this thing to try to build up some kind of uh, educational base so that we can build the movement up, not just here in Buffalo, but also for situations like this where we have some really important people talking about really important stuff coming through town and, and try to build a national support network and base for that kind of thing to happen, facilitate tours like this to get information out on really important issues like this, and um, so that's what we're doing. Um, thanks to everyone for coming out on Easter, because uh, for some people that means something, and for some of our families that means something too, so it's really good to see you know everyone here from, on Easter. So. If we could just kind of warm up by giving a round of applause to these people for making this trip. <laughs> not an easy thing to do touring around the country talking about anarchist long-term political prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you're not going to be making a lot of money doing this. So, um, let's just welcome them. Thank you. Um, just so everyone knows, this is being video and audio recorded. It's facing towards us. Um, there will be a Q and A at the end, which we will stop the recording so people can speak however they wish. Um, with that, we'd like to say thank you for Burning Books for having us here, and thanks for everyone to come out tonight. Um, we have the Never Alone tour. We'd like to start by asking everyone to move the batteries out of their cell phones. That's that's a bit of a joke. Uh, but if you could put on, if you could put on vibrate, that'd be really great. So that's not the presentation. Depending on your ambition. <laughs> It has been said that one must, one must choose their words carefully, and the three of us do subscribe to that notion. But the one who coined that phrase would have no idea just how careful we'd have to be in this day and age of conspiracy charges, entrapment, snitches, and long-term prison sentences. And with that, we hope you're starting to wonder what you got yourselves into by being here tonight. Well, the three of us are traveling out the country this month to shine a light on a couple of our friends who have been stolen from us. First. Jenny is here to speak about the case of Eric McDavid, who is, who is serving nearly 20 years in prison after being trapped by an FBI informant who went quite clearly is a thought crime. She is Eric's partner and has been doing support for him since his arrest in 2006. Next, Ian will be up. He will be speaking about Marie Mason, a dedicated anarchist that is doing 22 years in prison after her ex-husband snitched her out to the state and the 14 acts of sabotage that she probably took part in. Then Leslie will be uh, join us to talk about Marie's actions and some personal experiences with Marie. After that, Jenny will be speaking about doing long-term prisoner support. Then Ian will join Jenny to talk about building a culture of resistance. And finally, we'll talk about June 11th, the International Day of Solidarity with Marie, Eric, and long-term anarchist prisoners. But that's why we are here. Just for a moment, we'd like to shine attention on all of you. It's... <laughs> but... Do it. Okay. But don't get nervous, we're not going to make you meet your neighbor or some other hippie shit. <laughs> Perhaps a few of you came here tonight by seeing our snazzy poster in some hipster coffee shop. Maybe some of you have been doing prisoner support for a long time and already know about these cases. It's quite possible some in here are being paid by some three-letter acronym to write down the names of those who attend and what transpires, identified or not. Or maybe you got dragged here by some new friends you made last fall after sleeping in a park or plaza somewhere. But whatever reason you've come to be here, we hope you leave with a love for our friends and comrades who have been stolen from us and a hate for the society that put them there. And with that, I'd like to welcome Jenny to talk about Aaron David. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We're really glad to see you all out this evening. Um, we're going to talk tonight specifically about the cases of Aaron and Marie, but before we jump into the details of that, we wanted to just really quickly give you a little bit of context for these cases. Marie and Eric's cases are both part of a much larger push by the government that targets environmental and animal rights activists in this country. A lot of folks have started calling this the Green Scare. 
Will Potter, who does the excellent site, Green is the New Red, defines this as the disproportionate, heavy-handed government crackdown on the animal rights and environmental movements, and the reckless use of the word terrorism. Much like the Red Scare and the communist witch hunts of the 40s and 50s, the Green Scare is using one word, this time it's terrorist, to push a political agenda, instill fear, and chill dissent. And much like the Red Scare, the Green Scare is operating on three levels, legal, legislative, and what we'll call extra-legal, or scaremongering. As part of the Green Scare, the state has resurrected many strategies and tactics that were actually very prevalent during the COINTELPRO era. Um, COINTELPRO stands for Counterintelligence Program. And that's a program that took place between 1956 and 1971. These programs were aimed at groups like the Socialist Workers' Party, the American Indian Movement, the Black Panther Party, and the Civil Rights Movement in general. However, the FBI has used covert operations like this since its inception. Um, and it certainly didn't stop when COINTELPRO officially ended. These programs were aimed at surveilling, infiltrating, discrediting, and disrupting domestic political organizations, and that is exactly what the FBI is trying to do now in these green scare cases. Okay. So Eric was arrested in January of 2006 and charged with a single count of conspiracy to destroy by arson or explosives public and private property. No actions were ever carried out in Eric's case. He was basically charged with thinking and talking about the wrong things. His crime was, in essence, a thought crime. And his arrest was the direct result of a single informant known only as Anna. Eric had known Anna for about a year and a half at the time of his arrest. They originally met at a crime think gathering in Des Moines, Iowa in 2004. And when he met Anna, he thought she seemed energetic and knowledgeable, and he took an interest in her that soon grew into something more than just a friendship. But unfortunately, she was not who she seemed to be. Her identity as a seasoned activist was actually a very well-played act, concealing her identity as an undercover FBI informant. Her work with them actually began sometime before that. She was 17 at the time that she started working with them. She was enrolled in a class at a community college and wanted to go undercover, as she called it, and write a paper about the FTAA protests that were happening in Miami at the time. So she did that, she came back, presented the paper, and there was a cop in the class who thought the paper was great. He took it to his superiors. They called Anna into their office, and soon after that, she was working for the FBI in a very official capacity paid to infiltrate and spy on groups engaged in legal protest activity at things like crime think convergences, the G8, the Democratic National Convention, the Republican National Convention, and more. When Anna met Eric in Des Moines in 2004, she reported back to her handlers at the FBI that she thought he was safe and harmless and not a person of interest. In fact, she testified at trial that the reason she was hanging out with him in the first place was that he felt non-threatening. Despite that, she continued to seek him out at various protests, going so far as to email him um, and email other people inquiring as to his whereabouts. She basically had her hooks in, and she continued to manipulate that relationship to fabricate a crime and entrap Eric and his friends in it. By the, time, by the end of their time together, Eric was living in a house, traveling in a car, eating food, using computers, all of which were paid for by Anna and the FBI. In November of 2005, the FBI became concerned, as they said, that Eric hadn't made contact with Anna, so they formulated a plan to get the group together on the West Coast. When that happened, Eric was actually very hesitant about coming to that meeting. He said he had a lot of family stuff going on, and when it seemed like he wasn't going to come, Anna threw a huge fit, um, said that he was being selfish, and basically pushed him into coming. So they all met in November. At the end of that meeting, they still had no plan other than to meet again sometime in January, which they did. They met in a cabin in Dutch Flat, California, um, and moved into a cabin there together. And that's the cabin that Anna was paying for. They stayed there for about a week, a week that had prob probably proven to be incredibly frustrating for Anna as somebody who was trying to make things happen as quickly as possible. And after that week, the FBI moved in and arrested Eric, Zach, and Lauren. The night before they were arrested, the group had a huge fight. Um, it basically ended in Anna storming out of the cabin. She said that she was mad and frustrated because they couldn't stick to a plan, they couldn't set any goals, um, and basically she had to adapt to their changing whims. 
unbeknownst to the rest of the group, Anna left the cabin, walked down the street, and met with her FBI handlers, who told her that everybody would be arrested the next day. And that's exactly what happened. What are you doing? So, this is the criminal complaint from Eric's case. It's a pretty revealing document. It's about 15 pages long, and it uses the word anarchy, anarchist, or anarchism about 25 times in those 15 pages. It focuses not on any criminal history or nefarious criminal connections, because there were none, but instead focuses on things like lifestyle and legal protest activity. Train hopping, hitchhiking, dumpster diving, and traveling are all talked about as if they were evidence of a criminal mind. It talks about things like crime think, it mentions the books Days of War, Nights of Love, and Evasion repeatedly. The criminal complaint made it very clear from the beginning that this case was not about a crime being committed. Clearly there was no crime committed in the first place. But instead it was about the government's rapid pursuit of people who lead lives that they find threatening or unacceptable. Specifically in this case that would be anarchists. So Eric was arrested on January 13th, 2006, and immediately placed in what's called total separation, or solitary, and he stayed there for the duration of his time at Sac County Jail. Ultimately, it took about two years to bring his case to trial, and another seven months for him to get sentenced and then transferred. So this meant that he was in TSEP for about two and a half years. I don't know if I need to fully explain to everybody exactly what that meant for him physically and emotionally, um, basically, it meant that he had no real human contact for that time. He had no cellmate. Um, he wasn't supposed to be out of his cell when other people were. He was confined to his cell almost 24-7. Um, when he did get to go outside, it was about seven stories up with you know, concrete below and wire all around him. Visitation was really complicated because they had to block off the entire visitation space every time he wanted to have a visitor. So we'd often have to come in. Um, schedule a visit and then come back hours later to actually do the visit. Probably the most difficult thing for us and him though was that all of those visits at Sac County were behind a wall of plexiglass and on a phone. So the, for the first two and a half years that he was in jail, um, he had no contact with his loved ones at all. So during those two years, um, Eric went through two separate hunger strikes to try to get vegan food at Sac County Jail. Um, oops, sorry, skip the head bail. Um, we had to try to get bail first for Eric, and he was actually denied bail twice. The judge was claiming that he was a flight risk and a danger to the community. Both of these were really absurd claims. Eric had no criminal history whatsoever and definitely no history of violence. His family was putting up their much-loved home, which he never would have done anything to jeopardize. The judge's evidence to support his claims about Eric, if you could call it that, were that he knew how to live off the land and that he had no cell phone. Um, the fact that he had no cell phone was evidence in the judge's mind that he didn't have any way to contact his family when he was traveling, and so that meant he had no strong family ties. The prosecution in Eric's case also seemed to be claiming that prisoner support would whisk him away on some fantastical underground railroad to prisoner support if he got out on bail. Alerts that we sent out showed up in Discovery, and those alerts were about you know, how to write Eric a letter and how to send support to his legal fund. Um, also, visits, that prisoner support were vis visits from prisoner support at the jail were transcribed and also showed up in Discovery. And that kind of treatment of prisoner support continued throughout Eric's trial, sentencing, and on into the appeal stage. Eventually, we had to let go of the idea of getting bail and settle into the fact that Eric was going to be in Sac County pre-trial. And again, this meant that he was in jail for about two years before he was ever convicted of any crime. During those two years, um, Eric went on two separate hunger strikes to get vegan food. Both lasted about two weeks, and during those two weeks, hundreds of people from all over the globe were calling the jail, demanding that he be given vegan food. He also acquired a heart condition during his time at Sac County called pericarditis. It's basically a swelling of the sac around the heart. It's super scary. It feels a lot like a heart attack. It's really painful. Um, and it can also be very dangerous. Eric had no condition like this before his time at Sac County Jail, and we're very certain that this was a direct result of the poor nutrition he was receiving and also the stress of his confinement. So I think there are a few things quite as scary as watching your loved one go on hunger strikes and through scary medical conditions while they're in jail. 
But some things are just as complicated emotionally, and I think when Eric's co-defendants flipped and started cooperating with the government, it was really awful for everybody. Um, it was really terrible for us. I can't really imagine how terrible it was for him. Basically, what happened with Zach and Lauren was, in return for a lighter sentence, they flipped and decided to cooperate with the government. The charge that they pled to carried a five-year max instead of the 20-year max that Eric's charge carried. And in agreeing to cooperate, they agreed to not only testify against Eric at trial, but also in any and all investigations in which the government would deem them useful. So that could be anything from other grand jury proceedings, um, future debriefings and interviews, trials, and other court proceedings. Eric recently wrote some about his experiences during trial, and he had this to say about his former friends. Through the spring and summer, a once dear friend of mine survived isolation and continuous harassment. His folding just before fall was like my heart breaking in my hands. I tried to do all I could to aid him in maintaining some semblance of a foundation that he could utilize. Of course, it's not something which can be given, only found. He was released as soon as he signed his plea deal. To prep him for the stand, it took three consecutive days of nine to five. While on the stand, they used something like rehabilitated to describe him. When he flipped, I didn't think the pain could have gotten worse. What I saw and heard on the stand were the scared responses of someone being led along on a tight leash. The CI Anna wore business attire, mimicking the professionalism exuded by her fibby handlers. It twisted me up and down to hear the distance in her voice I recognized as always being there. So Eric's case finally went to trial in September of 2007. Anna, of course, was the government's main witness. She spent over two days on the stand, basically telling lie after lie about Eric. This was obviously not a surprise to us. We actually really expected this sort of behavior, but it was still pretty frustrating to sit and watch somebody who was paid $65,000 to destroy your loved one's life do this on the stand. We sat through days of testimony like this, but even their own witnesses' testimony and the surveillance tapes that they played at trial contained pretty damning evidence of government entrapment. And so we actually felt a little bit hopeful about what the outcome of the case might be. And then the jury started coming back during deliberations and asking questions. And their questions were really good. Um, their questions indicated that they were giving the entrapment issue serious consideration. To understand what actually happened in Eric's case, we have to know a little bit about conspiracy charges and how they work. So the government has the burden to prove that there was an agreement between the defendant and at least one other person to commit the crime that the defendant became a member of the conspiracy, knowing of at least one of its objects, and intending to help accomplish it, and one of the members of the conspiracy performed at least one overt act. The overt act does not have to be illegal, and in fact, could be just about anything. During closing arguments in Eric's case, the prosecution was making claims like, the minute they turned on the computer to do research, that was an overt act. And the minute that Lauren Wiener bought the book, The Poor Man's James Bond, that was an overt act. So again, basically anything that these folks did in their day-to-day -day life could be construed as an overt act in furtherance of this alleged conspiracy. The government also had the burden to prove entrapment. So they had to prove that the defendant, Eric, was predisposed to commit the crime before being contacted by a government agent, which obviously in this case was Anna, um, and this was very central in the outcome of Eric's trial. The defendant was not induced by the government agents to commit the crime. Obviously we need to know what predisposition means. I'm sure almost everybody here could probably figure that out on their own, um, but this was very complicated for the judge and the prosecution. Predisposition is supposed to mean a defendant would have been inclined to commit the crime without government involvement. And again, according to case law, that means prior to contact with a government agent. Unfortunately, what happened in Eric's trial is that the judge completely redefined this term predisposition. And the way that he did that was he said that first contact with Anna actually happened in July of 2005. Eric met Anna in August of 2004. So in redefining this term, the judge completely erased almost an entire year that Eric had met Anna, traveled with her, formed a relationship with her, and in fact even moved into a cabin with her right before his arrest. According to the judge, first contact meant the first time the defendant and the informant talked about the alleged crime. 
Obviously, in a conspiracy case, which is all based upon talking, once somebody is talking about committing a crime, they've clearly surpassed predisposition, and it renders the term completely useless. So in doing this, the judge completely altered the course of the jury's deliberations, and it basically ended up in Eric being convicted. We found out later that the jurors had talked to Mark, Mark, Eric's lawyer, and the media about what they thought about the case and how it all unfolded. It seemed like many of them actually wanted to acquit Eric, but thought that they were unable to because of these instructions from the judge. In fact, there was one mistake that we didn't even know about until after Eric was convicted. The jury had asked the judge during their deliberations, was Anna a government agent in August of 2004? Um, the judge said, you don't need to write all these answers down, they had a bunch of other questions, because I'm going to issue written responses when you get back to the deliberation room. He said, yes, she was a government agent in August of 2004, which was the correct answer, obviously. And then they got back to the deliberation room, and the written response said no. So clearly, again, this was incredibly confusing to them, and also completely changed the course of their deliberations, and they voted to convict. Certain members of the jury were also very disgusted with the government and Anna. They said that they, they thought she was a completely unreliable witness. Um, they said that the FBI overstepped their bounds and that they were a very scary organization. Two of the jurors actually submitted declarations for Eric prior to his sentencing, saying that they thought there was pretty clear evidence of entrapment and that Eric deserved, at the very least, a new trial. I'm going to play a clip now um, from an upcoming documentary it's called Greenlisted. Hopefully it will come out sometime in the next year or two. Um, the first part of the clip has some of the surveillance footage that was played during trial. It's from the night before their arrest. Uh, it gives you kind of a look at how pushy Anna was being. And the second part of the clip is some interviews with the jurors about um, how they felt about Anna and some of the FBI agents. seemed to make her very angry that they were kind of changing their mind a little bit. And she kept grilling them and saying, well, name a target. What target are, are you, do you want to bomb? And let's get back to the plan. We've got to get back to the plan. And I, I just thought it was curious that an FBI CI would be uh, suggesting things like that. But maybe that was what she was told to do. Ricardo Torres, her handler, was brought to the stand at the conclusion, I believe, of her rather long testimony in class. And he had a pretty poor performance in the minds of most of our of the jury. He's the one responsible for instructing her and getting supervising her. But based on his testimony, it wasn't clear that he had a clear understanding of what he should be doing. Mark asked him question after question about what was legal and what wasn't for Anna. And Taurus flat out said a number of times, I don't know. That was his response. I don't know what what's legal for her and what's not. The FBI agent said he just talked to her once, I think in person, and just went over kind of a short version of the rules. And then she might have signed something. And he was... Um, Concerned that uh, he wanted to cut short his testimony because he had a vacation to go to. I don't know if he made it to vacation, but um, we weren't really too concerned about that ourselves. So after Eric's trial, like I said before, we had to wait about seven months for him to get sentenced. 
Um, the government all along had been asking for the full 20 years for Eric, and the probation department was recommending 13, um, slightly better. But of course, and again, a very predictable move, the judge sided with the government and gave Eric almost the full 20 years. He got 19 years and seven months. Um, keep in mind the nature of the alleged crime here. Eric is not accused of having actually carried out any actions. Instead, he was charged with conspiring until Marie, actually, this was the longest sentence we knew of for any environmental prisoner in the United States. Even folks who had pled guilty to multiple arsons spanning many years had received sentences ranging from 3 to 13 years. Part of the reason Eric received such a long sentence is that the government successfully applied what's called the terrorism enhancement. <clears throat> And this can be applied if the offense is calculated to influence or affect the conduct of the government by intimidation or coercion or to retaliate against government conduct. It's a very broad definition um, and could probably be applied to just about any sort of protest activity that folks engage in these days. After Eric's sentencing, we were very curious to see what would happen with his co-defendants. As it turned out, we had to wait another seven months to find out. Zach was sentenced to time served, which for him was about six months. Um, he had spent about six months in Sac County before he took his plea and got out of jail. To call this a sentencing disparity seems euphemistic at best. Originally, the government was indicating that they were going to push for the full five years for Zach, but during the hearing, the government's position was that they were impressed by what they saw at trial, that Zach had turned his life around at jail time was not necessary for rehabilitation. Lauren Wiener was sentenced on December 11th, about a week later, and she also received time served, which for her was about two weeks. The other sort of interesting thing that happened during Lauren's sentencing hearing is that they talked a lot about her cooperation. Anybody who had contact with her, certainly before and certainly after her arrest, should know that their presence was definitely reported to the FBI. Her lawyer used her extensive cooperation as leverage to gain a lighter sentence for her, claiming that giving her jail time would be counterproductive to the message of early cooperation and its rewards. After, um, after he was sentenced, we had to wait a little while for Eric to get transferred, and we were pretty nervous about where he was going to get sent just because of the length of his sentence and because of the terrorism enhancement. Um, given all of that, we were kind of relieved when he got sent to Victorville, which is a medium security facility in Southern California. It's about six and a half hours from where I live and where his family lives. Um, a lot of other vegan folks have not had trouble getting food there, so we were really stoked about that. It was probably the first sort of good news we had gotten in a while, if you could call it that. Um, and then in November of last year, we got more good news when he was moved to Terminal Island, which is a terrible name for a prison, but um, it's a low security facility in LA. And some things about his living situation have gotten a little bit better there. For example, probably the thing that's coolest for me um, is that we, have, we can hold hands during visits, which we haven't been able to do in like six years. So we're really stoked about that. Um, as far as legal options for Eric, he's basically at the end of the road. His appeals were denied by the Ninth Circuit. Um, we tried to appeal to the Supreme Court. They wouldn't hear it. That's pretty typical. The only thing left for him legally, really, is a habeas petition, which we're going to file. Um, realistically, the chances of that being successful are basically zero. Probably, um, at some point, we could look into filing a commutation of sentence stuff or presidential pardon. I'm sure you all could guess as to how successful those things might be. Um, so at this point, we're really just trying to settle into the fact that Eric's going to be in prison for a long time. And we need to start thinking about how to do long-term support for him and for other folks. And that's why we're here tonight. In the meantime, um, you can always write Eric letters. He would love to hear from you. Um, his address is up on his website, which is supporteric.org. Also, if you want to geek out on legal documents, there's a ton of stuff up on his website. All the transcripts from trial are there. Um, a bunch of stuff from like Zach and Lauren sentencing and all that stuff is up there as well. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Ian. and he's going to tell us about Marie. Okay. Um, so I'm here to talk about Marie Mason, who is a 50-year-old mother of two, who at the time of her arrest in 2008 had been an activist in various causes around the Midwest for close to 30 years. Before her arrest, she was a community gardener, a musician, a writer, and an editor for radical publications such as Fifth Estate, and worked with numerous organizations for various causes. But really, I can't 
introduce Marie nearly as well as she can. So I'll just let her do it. Hi, my name is Marie Mason and I work with the Streetwater Alliance. Uh, I've been a community, peace, social justice, and environmental activist for some 20 odd years and have built up connections to a lot of those movements uh, in, in my area and also around the, around the world. One of the There's Mary. <laughs> um, like the late Judy Berry, Marie worked to link the environmental and labor movements by stitching together the work and ideas of environmental groups like Earth First with unions like the Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies. As well as creating links between issues and movements, she created links to generations, bridging the past and the future, and bringing people together. Marie was involved for years in above-ground organizing around the Midwest in various environmental causes, among other things. For example, anti-infrastructure, anti-longing, anti-development. She utilized a diversity of tactics in her work. She did a lot of civil disobedience, a lot of public organizing work and education, that video that I played a second ago was from a documentary about water privatization in the Detroit area. She worked in coalitions. She also did underground work against the same projects she had been trying to stop. In the late 1990s, Marie met a man named Frank Ambrose. The two of them got together and got married the next year. They were married for several years. They worked on activist projects together, both in environmental groups and in the Wobblies. In 2001, Frank was charged with, with the first person charged with Earth Liberation Front activity in the United States. He was charged with a Class D federal felony for tree spiking. Marie was one of the people who spearheaded a public protest and pressure campaign against the prosecution and the government to try to get them to drop the charges against Frank. After uh, they called for a week of resistance involving protests at various places that Marie and Frank found important. There were other things happening. There was a critical mass. There were things um, relating to the like courthouse rallies, things like that. After all of that, the prosecution was sufficiently publicly embarrassed that they were forced to drop the charges against Frank. This was, I would imagine, intolerable public humiliation for the government. Because after that, Marie and Frank were harassed ever since, especially when ELF actions had occurred, occurred in their community. They were followed around the country by federal agents. Their employers and their families were harassed. They were constantly visited, subpoenaed to grand juries, which they refused to cooperate with, forced to submit DNA evidence to the government, and kept under surveillance. Marie and Frank were easy targets as public activists and opponents of genetic engineering and forest destruction, among other things. Years later, and after the advent of the Green Scare, Marie and Frank had separated, although they were still legally married. Marie had moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, and was working as an extended care assistant at a small school there, as well as working on Wobbly Union organizing. Frank was still living in Michigan. The FBI, for their parts, had been investigating Earth Liberation Front activity in the Midwest for years, and despite their harassment of Marie, Frank, and others, they hadn't had much luck. In April of 2007, the FBI claims that they got a break in previous cold cases. At that time, the story, according to the FBI, is that a local business owner in Michigan, not far from the workplace of Frank Ambrose, discovered some boxes in a dumpster that hadn't been there the night before. The boxes, according to this person and the FBI, contained, uh, one of the boxes contained a uh, long canvas strap, candle wax, M80s, things that could be considered ingredients for incendiary devices. One of the boxes, according to the FBI, contained two gas masks, one of which was labeled Frank's gas masks, one of the boxes, according to the FBI, contained Earth First literature, what the government termed anti-government writings, and printed out email correspondence between Marie and Frank and various environmental groups talking about public campaigns. And one of the boxes, according to the FBI, contained uh, personal and financial records bearing the names of Marie Mason and Frank Ambrose. This is a pretty shaky story, I think, for various reasons. But that's what they said happened. In any case, the FBI used it as a basis to issue a search warrant for Frank Ambrose's house. And in the process of doing that, they brought Frank in for questioning. At that point, despite his previous resistance to repression, Frank Ambrose, Frank Ambrose